And we are live to talk about the threats against Supreme Court justices and pro-life groups and how the Biden administration is not, not only not condemning it, but encouraging it. Uh, the, the inflation that the Biden administration assured us was transitory is not their fault at all, by the way, but it just keeps on chugging along, especially at the gas pump. And the latest in ESG news, that's the left's desire to give everyone an environment, social, and governance score. We'll be talking about all of this and more on episode 345 of the In the Tank podcast. All right, and this podcast has begun. I am your host, Jim Lakely. I'm vice president of the Heartland Institute. Our usual host, Donald Kendall, is absent today. He'll be back next week. And joining us today is pretty much a lot of the regular crew. We'll start off with Chris Talgo, senior editor here at the Heartland Institute. How are you doing? Good, sir. Doing good. Weather's finally heating up here, Jim. Uh, Chicago is uh, finally out of the cold, long winter. I am yeah. just ecstatic. Yes, uh, and people watching on the um, uh, watching on the YouTube channel right now, or Rumble, or Twitter, or Facebook might notice that my nose is uh, kind of shiny, like Rudolph's. <laughs> it's a little red. I got a little carried away out in the the first day of real bright sunshine we've had here in like two months. So uh, still healing from that. Also joining us today is a research fellow for energy policy here at the Heartland Institute, Linnea Lukin. How are you, Linnea? Hello, I'm doing well. Uh, this week is in the high 90s here in South Louisiana, so um, I'm already tired of it. I'm already ready to go back to the 70 degree <laughs> winters that we have here, so... <laughs> Well, all right. Well, that makes one of you, I guess. It's actually the, it's actually in the low 90s here in Chicago today. It has been for the last two days. It's kind of crazy. And then we're going to go back down into more temperate temperatures. But, you know, we got a little spring or a little summer preview here in uh, northern Illinois. And also joining us from here, also in the office in northern Illinois at the Heartland Institute, is a research fellow for our Socialism Center, Jack McFerrin. Hey, Jack. Hey, um, you know, I'm with I'm with Linnea on this. Anything in the 90s and even in really the 80s is a little bit too much heat for me. I, I feel like we missed spring um, and we missed even like mild summer. And I'm not really a fan of this whole sweltering heat thing. Well, either you're, way, you're incorrect. <laughs> incorrect so whatever all right <laughs> so well speaking of uh, speaking of Illinois uh, our president Joe Biden uh, had an event I think with some union guys uh, one of the unions here in in uh, Chicago area and he blamed Trump for inflation and the trillions in spending last year maybe he even blamed him for the baby formula shortage that's uh, that's going on out there but he called Trump the great MAGA king now surely Biden thought that of that as an insult but I have a feeling that uh, uh, Trump's not going to take it that way and neither are his fans Chris Talgo will you bend the knee to the great MAGA king well, in general, I am uh, definitely on board with the MAGA agenda, but I've I've noticed in the past week or so that uh, Joe Biden has gone out of his way to uh, tar and feather the MAGA agenda, whether it's the ultra MAGA agenda, being responsible for inflation, which I'm sure we'll get into later, uh, to uh, trying to uh, portray Donald Trump as the king of MAGA. I just think that Biden's desperate and he's you know throwing everything at the wall, hoping it'll stick. And guess what? It's not. Well, I mean, it's, he's not. So he's he's the great MAGA king, which uh, I mean, gosh, that's just awesome. But this comes on the week where now I guess it's a slur where it's the ultra MAGA agenda. There's a uh, um, a woman running in the Republican primary for Senate in uh, in Pennsylvania. I think Kathy Baynett. I'll have to look that up. Uh, I know her first name is Kathy. Uh, she's an African-American woman who is a staunch conservative. And now she's being smeared as ultra MAGA. And <laughs> I think just like when they were going after after Trump in the beginning, you know, the whole the whole idea of MAGA. Now it's ultra MAGA. Uh, I think Biden had said that as well. I saw a clip of Jen Psaki, White House spokesperson, laughing and thinking, you know, well, that's what the president said. And that's what we think. You know, it's an ultra MAGA radical agenda. 
Linnea Lucan, one of the things about the MAGA agenda, of course, MAGA stands for Make America Great Again, is that it appealed to a pretty broad, uh, you know, pretty broad audience, I should say, among Republicans. But that MAGA agenda, that Make America Great Again agenda, brought in all these independents on Trump's side, too. That's why he won in 2016. Well, yeah, and I think I've seen that. I think a lot of it brought in, surprisingly enough, when it turned out that uh, Bernie Sanders wasn't going to be the candidate for the Democrats. A lot, like a shocking number of his fans came over to the right. And uh, once they were in the MAGA crew, um, they got you know educated on some of the economic policies that they're wrong about, <laughs> luckily, a lot of them. Um, and so they've become good friends of the... I guess, MAGA movement too. And if we're becoming ultra MAGA now and the memes keep rolling out like this, I, I think that's a pretty good indicator of um, where the Republican Party is at. And uh, I think that a lot of those establishment guys don't like it and they think that it's an insult to be called ultra MAGA. But people like me just roll with it. I mean, it's so fun. <laughs> it's uh, They just, they make it sound cooler every time they say it, so... That's true. Tim, okay. Tim slight, yeah. slight update. Mega has now uh, been uh, changed to make affordable gas again. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that like that. will work. I like that. That will work. Jack, uh, are you ultra mega, regular mega, super ultra mega? Uh, <laughs> you know, it's fun. <laughs> it's funny. Like Mag mega is, is supposedly being used in a derogatory way, but it, it's all about doing what's in the national interest, what's best for America. It's about making America great again and not subordinating our interests to, you know, international organizations and, and you know, climate agendas in, at the United Nations. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I would say that I'm very much in the interest of America. Okay, great. Well, that's our opening banter for the day. Thank you, everyone, <laughs> for participating in that. I just think it's... Uh, you know, it's it's kind of like on the fence. People are like, will Trump run again? I mean, you know, he, he had hinted a few months ago that, you know, well, maybe health issues would keep me from running for president again, uh, you know, to give himself a little bit of an out. But God, if the left keeps, you know, calling him the great mega king, I don't think he can resist running in the Republican primary. Uh, that is that is catnip for his ego. Uh, but uh, before we get into our big topics for today, we do have a lot to unpack, a lot of important issues to talk about. I want to uh, ask our listeners, if you're listening in the audio only version, which comes out on Fridays, uh, to please share and like that uh, that podcast. Uh, let your friends know about it if you enjoy it and subscribe anywhere you can get your podcast. And if you're watching this, either here on our flagship Heartland Institute um, YouTube channel called Heartland Tube or on our special new In the Tank channel called In the Tank Podcast, which we had to set up just in case uh, we say something that the YouTube, Google, Alphabet people don't like and nuke our channel from space and get rid of all of our almost 40,000 subscribers. You can always listen to it at the In the Tank Podcast channel. Please like and subscribe to both of those channels and hit the bell so that you can get a notification when each of these shows go live, which is every Thursday at noon central time uh, on uh, live streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and uh, right here. Oh, I'm sorry. And also on Twitter and Rumble. We got to remember that as well. We're going to we're going to try to live stream in as many places as we can uh, to make it harder for us to be suppressed by the big tech overlords. So uh, that is that. And with that out of the way, I want to get to our, our first topic here. Uh, and that is the threat on uh, on the Supreme Court and other protests that are that are going on. Now, uh, to the listeners, I'm actually I'm actually hosting and producing this 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 uh, podcast while also trying to comment on it. So if I stumble or pause for a moment, it's because uh, I'm trying to do seven things at once. But one of the things here is like uh, there was there was a firebombing. OK, so a an ant a, a pro-abortion leftist group firebombed a uh, pro-life office in Madison, Wisconsin, um, setting up a pro-life, if people don't know much about Madison, setting up a pro-life uh, office in Madison, Wisconsin is kind of like setting up a, uh, a vegan snack stand at, uh, at the Texas State Fair. You know, it's just, <laughs> no one's going to be interested in it. It's, it's really an outlier. Uh, but the, the, one of the things that was, it's outrageous about this, of course, but one of the things that was outrageous was the, um, 
the way the our mainstream press, the Associated Press and our wire services characterized this attack on a on a pro-life office in Madison, Wisconsin. A Molotov cocktail was thrown into the window. Um, the Associated Press in tweets says that said, quote, fire breaks out at pro-life office in Wisconsin um, after after protesters visited or something like that. It was completely ridiculous. But this is typical of our corrupt our corrupt media these days. And in addition to that, and that came on, the, I guess, the day after, um, you know, of course, the the leaked opinion by Alito from the Supreme Court on Roe v. Wade, hundreds of people started showing up in front of the homes of Supreme Court justices. And this is just not done. Uh, it's, in fact, Jen Psaki was asked about this in the uh, in the press briefing room the other day. And I'm going to play I'm going to play the clip here. This is her reaction to protesters showing up outside of where Supreme Court justices live, where their children sleep. There's an outrage right now, I guess, about uh, protests that have been peaceful to date. And we certainly continue to encourage that outside of judges' homes. And that's the president's position. I'm going to play that one more time. Listen very carefully here. This is only nine seconds. I know that there's an outrage right now, I guess, about uh, protests that have been peaceful to date. And we certainly continue to encourage that outside of judges' homes. And that's the president's position. So she, she isn't, it, by the way, it is a federal crime. It really is. It's a federal crime to protest outside the home of any judge, let alone a Supreme Court justice. Um, and there's good reason for that. And it is because the judiciary and judges have to uh, make decisions based solely on the law and cannot be under the um, under public pressure like that. Where And, and again, the, the, the intent here, and Jen Psaki is just blowing it off. It's like, oh, as long as they're out there peacefully protesting. You are sending, you are lit literally with those statements, she is sending leftist shock troops, encouraging them to, to camp out outside the homes, the homes of Supreme Court justices, again, where their children sleep, to intimidate them and to, and she's encouraging this. I don't know, somewhere around uh, the 6th of January, there was somebody else who encouraged people to, to march somewhere, but it was in a public place. It was the Capitol building. And it's it just, it, I'm just gobsmacked, Chris. I mean, this, this is, there seem to be no limits no limits at all on what the left is willing to do to get their way. They have zero respect for the uh, judicial branch. And that's, you know, very apparent right now. And uh, there's, there's so many, you know, things that need to be unpacked here. Uh, one of the first things is, could you imagine the outrage if the shoe was on the other foot and you had a bunch of anti-abortion protesters camped outside of Elena Kagan's house or, you know, any uh, liberal Supreme Court justice, the left would be on fire. OK. And also just just because you know, this is very important. What if during a jury trial, a bunch of uh, people wanted to go and uh, picket and try to intimidate outside of the jurors homes? We would that would be universally panned and it should be universally panned because the entire point of the justice system is that these people are supposed to make decisions without threat of intimidation or without threat of reprisal if they do not make the decision that the protesters do not like. So it's just, it, it, it's, it's ridiculous. It's, it's sad. And, you know, shame on uh, outgoing press secretary Jen Psaki for uh, encouraging uh, the breaking of federal law. It's just, it's, it's ludicrous. Can't, can't, I can't believe it actually. Linnea, I wonder if you have any any reaction to this. I mean, the you know you're 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 younger. I'm I'm older. I'm 51 years old. I've seen a lot of political activity in my time. Uh, this is straight out of the Alinsky playbook, uh, and it, to have it being encouraged again, the breaking of federal law. Say, say what you will about that one day in the first month of 2021. I guess if I if I say the right if I say the wrong words, this might get flagged by the algorithm. But say what you want about that. Uh, that event, uh, it was uh, in a public place. A small number of people obviously committed crimes, and God knows they're still rotting in prison right now without trial. Uh, this is crossing a line, I think. Um, what, what's your reaction to this news? Not only is it federally illegal, but it also is continuing to reinforce this very cynical position that I've begun to take that we actually don't live in a nation of laws. We live in a nation of two different sets of laws 
depending on which side of the aisle you're on. And that's regardless of who's president. Even during Trump's presidency, you have the FBI kicking in uh, doors of um, Republican staffers. Uh, I'm blanking on the name of the exact one that uh, I'm trying to reference. But Roger um, Stone? Yeah, uh, Roger Stone, poor guy comes out in his pajamas and bunny slippers and it's a full raid style, you know, night attack. <laughs> it's just absurd. Um, meanwhile, uh, Democrats can be caught on camera breaking the law and nothing happens to them. Um, I, I This morning I was listening to a podcast and heard a um, progressive make the absurd claim that it's not illegal because there's no evidence that the protesters outside of the judge's home are trying to influence their decisions. Uh and this is this is the kind of position that they'll take where they'll they'll parse it down and they'll say, well, they're only chanting my body, my choice or whatever. So therefore, it's clear that they're just giving their opinion. They're not trying to influence anything, which is patently absurd. But they'll do this. They'll they'll parse it down and the whole media will go along with it and will give them cover. And so nothing will have to happen to any of these people. Same with the rioters of the couple of years ago. They're burning down cities and stuff, and barely any of them were arrested, and most of them did not go to jail for any kind of uh, extended period. And we have a vice president who funded um, their release from prison. So it's there's two sets of laws. Uh, the Democrats don't have to play by the same rules that we do. Yeah, I, so I, I was looking at the legal aspect, too, and it looks like the U.S. Code says that it's only it's illegal to um to do this with the intent of interfering obstructing impeding or influencing any decision and obviously that's what these people are trying to do but the way that they will defend it is by saying that they're free to express their outrage right which is a ridiculous defense but i guess that that's how they will game the legal system right Jim, you're muted. Thank you. Yes. Uh, there's just different rules here, both in our culture and our media and apparently with our law enforcement. I mean, the, the fact uh, you could talk about the event on the first month of 2021 uh, and how uh, that was that was handled by our FBI. Is the FBI. Has anyone asked the FBI? If they are investigating any of these any of these people, I'm going to share on the screen here. Uh, here's a uh, here's a link to a story from Fox 47 in um, in Wisconsin. And it says nationwide group claiming to be behind Wisconsin family action firebombing issues warning. I wonder if the FBI is involved in this. I mean, it, when parents showed up at school board meetings, which is a public place, by the way, which they are invited to actually come and do to comment on what's going on on their school boards. The FBI calls them domestic terrorists and opens up files on them. But here we have something, a group called uh, Jane's Revenge. Uh, they're on Reddit and they're, they're ev everywhere else. They're, they're, they're a shadowy, radical left-wing group. Um, they claim to be responsible for that arson and graffiti on the front of that building that said, if abortions aren't safe, then you aren't either. An explicit threat. Uh, according to a report from Bellingcat, Bellingcat is an international investigative journalism organization, organization. The group known as Jane's Revenge demanded the disbanding of all anti-choice groups, fake clinics, and violent anti-choice groups within the next 30 days. Uh, let's see. They have their full statement down here. They, they posted it on Reddit. It is uh, here. They say this. This is not a declaration of war. War has been upon us for decades, a war which we did not want and did not provoke. Too long have we been attacked for asking, a, for asking for basic medical care. Too long have we been shot, bombed, and forced into childbirth without consent. This was only a warning. We demand the disbanding of all anti-choice establishments, fake clinics, and violent anti-choice groups within the next 30 days. This is not a mere difference of opinion, as some have framed it. We are literally fighting for our lives. We will not sit while we are killed and forced into servitude. And it goes on. Uh, now, that's... That's quite a take <laughs> on on uh, Roe v. Wade being uh, nullified and abortion laws being left up to the states as they are right now, varying uh, varying laws out there uh, on abortion from state to state. But um, again, where how come nobody's asking the FBI whether they're investigating this? 
well, or find, trying to find out who these people are when they when they are still there are people from that first month in January 2021 who have been charged with misdemeanors, things like parading around a public place without a permit. And they're still sitting in jail without a trial for more for now, more than a year. What is it now? Eight, almost 18 months. And, th and this kind of thing happens. And nobody asked the FBI again. People show up at school board meetings to to uh, to complain about the radicalization of their children through the curriculum in some of these schools, which has been completely taken over by the left. And the FBI holds a press conference saying that these people are going to be considered domestic terrorists and they're opening files on them. And yet here we have this going on and there isn't a peep. And nobody's asking Jen Psaki about this. No one's asking Jen Psaki if, if you know, maybe you should discourage people from breaking the law to express their opinions. Nope. She just blows it off. Jack, you were going to jump in before I went on a rant. <laughs> no, I, I think it's I think it's all ridiculous. I think that, you know, frankly, if, if you were to ask the FBI to do this, they would probably, you know, say they would do it and then not do anything or, or frankly support these people, you know, behind the scenes. They're, uh, they're a pawn of the Biden administration and, you know, they're not going to help. Yeah, Jim, uh, the FBI has has been politicized since day one of the Biden administration. And uh, I, I wonder where the FBI's uh, investigation concerning the Supreme Court leak is uh, right now, because I haven't heard a peep about that. So I, 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 th I think that these things are very related. And what they what they are, they're sending a message to the Supreme Court and all the courts below the Supreme Court saying, if you do not uh, toe the liberal line, there's going to be, you know, there, there, there's going to be hell to pay. You're muted, Jim. Thank you again. I'm sorry. Linnea, were you going to pop in with something? Yeah, I was going to say, just keep in mind, this is the same FBI that could devote uh, more than a dozen, I think, agents to investigating a NASCAR garage door pull. Um, at It's... They're, they have no interest. If, if the FBI's leadership has no interest in investigating this stuff, it's just not going to happen. Oh, Jim, you're muted. Okay, gosh. All right. We're going to, I'm killing it here. <laughs> I told you it's hard to host, comment and produce at the same time. Okay, so here we have a video on the screen. This is um, this is a Catholic mass, uh, women, uh, radical leftists in, oh, shocker, Handmaid's Tale outfits. Gosh, they never get any more creative than that. <laughs> uh, decided, again, a call from the left to do this. Call went out. Go to, go to Catholic, on Mother's Day, no less. Go to, Catholic, go to your local uh, Catholic church on, during mass and take direct action. This is what the leftists do all the time. They, 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 they make it sound heroic. We're taking direct action for change. It's like, no, you're not. You're being an obnoxious jerk. And often you're breaking the law and you are exploiting the, frankly, the, the good naturedness of your political opponents on the right, for the most part. You're taking advantage of the fact that most people wouldn't do something like this. And that even if you interrupt something as, as sacred, frankly, as mass on Mother's Day, during the Easter season, you're not going to be, um, well, here in this video clip, they are escorted from the church, but not before they disrupted it. And just, there's just this idea on the left. Again, this goes back to Saul Alinsky. This goes back to the 60s radicals. This goes back to the Students for Democratic Action. It, go, it goes to all of these groups. This has been a decades long tactic by these people that they will never give you peace. This is why surrendering policy wise to the left is always a losing proposition because there is no victory for them. They never just they never just say, you know what, we've done it, guys. We, we've achieved the policy goals we want. No, they never say that because they're never done. It's always continual revolution. They play, by, they play by a different set of rules and justify the means, which means that their tactics are are, you know, just untethered from, uh, you know, the, the mores and the uh, norms of society because yeah. politics trumps everything. Yeah. Well, here, I'm going to play. This is about a two minute long clip and uh, people just listening will be able to hear it and, and, and figure out what's going on. But these are these are radical leftists in hands made tail outfits uh, invading and trying to actually get up to the sacristy of the of, of the of the church to presumably stand in front of everybody and shout down the priest trying to conduct mass. <laughs> Get off of here. 
You are not, you are not attacking anybody. You're attacking me right now. Your you started attacking me. No, you're going towards our preacher. All of these people watching. You can't go towards our preacher. Get out of here. You're not. You turned it into something else. You're trying to keep you away from the preachers. You have to keep you away from the preachers. You gotta get away from respecting women. You wanna come and attack them. Respect us. Respect us. You want to respect me? As you guys want respect, we want respect too. I understand that. Get out of here. Get out of here. I do. Just respect them. You know what? I promise you, I understand you with yourself. I understand. We are with you. But please, let us worship. Let us show you respect. Please. Wow. Please. You're such a falsehood. You even practice Christian Christian things when you're out there. I like that the organist is playing accompanying music for their disposition. These are, these are people just trying to pray, to worship, for Mass on Mother's Day. That is that is the nicest <laughs> the nicest getting kicked out of some place I've ever seen in my life. Which is just what you could expect. And then they're shouting as they're going, get off of me. Get your hands off me. I don't know if you so that, had sorry. No, yeah, I mean, but that that's that's your modern left today. I mean, I can't think well, I mean, I guess you know, people on the right went to school board meetings. <laughs> but that was a public that was a public meeting in which public comment is actually encouraged. Well, go ahead, Lynn. And that's not the only issue here. This actually, what they've done is uh, federally illegal. There was a 1994 law that banned uh, pro uh, or anti-abortion activists from being allowed to um, like block entrances and stuff to abortion facilities. And in that same law, it makes it illegal for pro-abortion activists to enter uh, places of religious worship for part of their um, protest. So it's actually federally illegal for what they've done, but I guarantee that not a single one of those people are going to be arrested. And what, what concerns me too is I immediately notice in the video that they're bringing backpacks in. I do not like that. <laughs> I, if I was, you know, if they had a security guard or something at this uh, cathedral or this big church here, um, which I think is in Los Angeles, uh, there's no way you let them in with backpacks and stuff. It's just, it's a huge security hazard. Um, and after what's happened previously in Texas and other places, it's, uh, I'm beside myself that they got as far in as they did. What I find most frightening is that this is just the initial reaction to the draft opinion release. I can't even imagine what is going to happen if and when the Supreme Court does nullify Roe v. Wade in uh, late June. Well, yeah, I mean, that's still an open question. As I said on last week's podcast, I would I'm actually and the more I've thought about it. You know, I think it's I think it's slightly more likely than not that the opinion that we actually get the final opinion this summer handed down will be not what we read in the draft. It will be quite different and it'll be watered down. Jack, you got something to add to here before we move on to our next topic? So are you suggest, do you think that the Supreme Court justices will be swayed by this sort of public outrage in some way, shape or form? I don't uh, Nope. I mean, of course not. I mean, I th actually, I think this is playing into the hands of those who want that Alito decision to be the final law. I mean, how can you possibly, no matter where you are on this, you can't possibly back down on this or that this is this becomes the rule that every time um, either side has a decision that they don't like or suspects there's going to be a decision they don't like that they take direct action and frankly threaten the lives and certainly threaten the peace of those of those supreme court justices they cannot they cannot actually rule in favor of the left on this one and have any credibility with the court whatsoever yeah they've, they've retrenched themselves further because if they do they lose complete legitimacy in the entire institution so right they have to rule in right the uh, other way and, and let's also let's also just uh, to put a kind of a bow on this you know it's the idea again which as i played the clip in the beginning 
Jen Psaki encouraging, not, and I, not even failing to condemn, but encouraging people to show up at the homes of Supreme Court justices. Now, a responsible White House spokesperson would say the proper place to have your voice heard and for the Supreme Court justices themselves to know you were there and to hear it is to go to the Supreme Court on the street in a public place where there are regular protests. There is only one reason to go to the home of a, of a like say, Brett Kavanaugh, who has daughters, teenage young daughters, to go to the home of Sam Alito. It is to frighten their families. It is to send the message that you are not safe. We know where you live. We know where your children sleep. If this happened, again, as I think you mentioned this, Linnea, if pro-choice, or I'm sorry, if pro-life protesters were going to the home of Ruth Bader Ginsburg or when she was alive, or even right now, if they were to go to the home of Sonia Sotomayor, who is definitely not going to vote to uh, repeal Roe v. Wade, the, the media would cover this differently. <laughs> the, every single Republican in Congress would be asked directly to denounce such tactics. But again, and they would. Live, and they would. And they exactly right. And they would denounce such tactics. But we live in a, in a very different world today where the left has no rules. They're not held accountable for anything, even direct threats on people like I showed on that. Uh, that one was it called Jane's uh, Jane's Revenge. Yeah, the FBI is probably not going to do anything about that either. It's, you know, <laughs> This this has to this has to stop. I mean, this is what the left wants is continual revolution. This is why you know when you, you if if you know if you have any family members who lived in Cuba, or China today, or Russia, or the Soviet Union back in the day, the revolution never ends. You're never allowed any peace, and this is what's this is what the left has done in this country. No one has ever allowed a moment's peace if you disagree with them. Chris, I'll let you have the last word while I queue up the next topic. I mean, I think we really hit uh, most of the points here. I just uh, hope that the Supreme Court, uh, you know, stays strong. And I and I desperately hope that uh, the American people see through this. And I think they, I think they do. I think they definitely do. Okay. Well, that's uh, that's comforting. All right. <laughs> Next topic here. We're going to get to. I'm an optimist. Little... <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, that makes one of you. So, All right. So we're going to go to a, a topic here that's also very serious, not quite as serious as the previous one but very important right now. Uh, inflation has barreled ahead. Uh, this is the headline from CNBC. Inflation barreled ahead at 8.3% in April from April of 2021, remaining near 40-year highs. Uh, leftist journalists uh, in the mainstream, the, the former mainstream, uh, and I think the administration itself touted the idea that, well, inflation is actually stabilizing or going down because I think the uh, the year over year inflation last month was 8.5 percent. So it's gone down two tenths of a percent. Uh, the reason that happened, actually, is because in the month of April, gas prices went down yeah. uh, temporarily for a couple of weeks. And now they're right back up again. Uh, in fact, I had to fill up my tank today. I think a week ago, last time I filled it up, it was four four twenty nine a gallon. Today, this morning, it was four fifty nine a gallon. Uh, so gas prices are going back up again. Uh, we had a uh, so, so that's so that's happening there, and so gas prices and energy prices are a big part of the inflation. Uh, before we get into the <laughs> before we get into the gas prices and its effect on inflation and all of that you stuff, guys. should Americans? This is a video of uh, made by somebody on Twitter called Mays Moore uh, that. This is what the administration has been saying about inflation for the last year. The, the comments start in February of 2021 and run in, run until last month. This is, uh, well, this is, speaks for itself. Are you worried about inflation, sir? Well, I, I really doubt that we're going to see an inflationary cycle. And by the way, talk of inflation, the overwhelming consensus is going to pop up a little bit and then go back down. I don't know anybody, including Larry Summers, who's a friend of mine, yeah. who's worried about inflation. We also know that as our economy has come roaring back, we've seen some price increases. Some folks have raised worries that this could be a sign of persistent inflation. But that's not our view. Thank you less than they did two Inflation, years. you said? Yeah. Okay. Well, I would first say that uh, one of the steps that we've taken as an administration is to provide 
uh, a range of assistance uh, to the American people, whether it is in the form of $1,400 checks. Caitlin, if you actually look at the uh, numbers and the trends over the last several months, it shows that core inflation uh, one was not only below uh, expectations, but it decelerated from last month. You had told uh, us at a town hall, I think it was in July, that the in, this was just near-term inflation. Number one thing that the president can do is help get COVID under control. Uh, that, we know, is the root cause of inflation and the price increases we're seeing for a range of reasons. And finally, even as we meet, even as we meet to work uh, out this challenge, it's important to maintain perspective. Prices have gone up and families and individuals are dealing with the realities of, of the, that bread costs more, that gas costs more. Now we have to understand what that means. That's about the cost of living going up. When people go to the grocery store and a pound of meat is more expensive than it should be. We agree, that's less related to supply chain issues. The inflation has everything to do with the supply chain. Inflation is up, it's up. The second big reason for inflation is Vladimir Putin. We are in the best of hands, folks. Jim, is steam, is steam coming out of my ears? <laughs> it's, it's going through your headphones for sure. I think so. I, I feel I, it. I, I know. I, I mean, that is quite the that is quite the litany of excuses. That runs from like I think February 2021 until uh, until last month, and I'd forgotten that they were blaming inflation on on uh, big meat and other and other uh, corporate yeah. price gougers. I mean, God Almighty. <laughs> Go ahead. One thing that struck me was was Jen Psaki saying that one of the ways that she was going to help people get through inflation was by sending them yeah. checks. Yeah, right. Because, because get, pumping the economy full of more money yeah. is for sure going to help inflation. Yeah, it's it's just absurd that these are the people leading our country and trying to fix the crisis supposedly. Yeah. Well, yeah, like I said, we're we're in the best of hands, or as they said on uh, Indiana Jones, top men. So, Chris, you've been doing a lot of writing about uh, inflation. I know I see uh, your your op eds. I think some of them have already been published. Some are being pitched out there about uh, about the inflation crisis and and this this administration. In fact, I read something today, and just to kind of help set this up, maybe you know, you could talk a little bit about what you've written on this on this topic. But uh, yeah, it was it was the governor of of New Hampshire that pointed this out. You know, all that stimulus money that went out, the infrastructure bill. None of that money has been spent yet. Right. A trillion dollars, more than, I think it was $1.7 trillion in infrastructure spending hasn't entered the economy yet. So, so inflation is going to get worse because a lot of that government spending is just kind of hanging out there over our, over our heads, like the sword of Damocles. You know, just from the 30,000 uh, foot perspective, inflation can be most simply defined as uh, the government, uh, devaluing or debasing the dollar, which causes price distortions. So really what's been happening here, and this has been going on for a very long time, uh, the government has been printing money and spending way too much money. And uh, this has just been put on, you know, hyperspeed over the past year or so with the 1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan and then the 1.1 trillion uh, American Infrastructure Plan. That is $3 trillion just flooding into an already flooded economy with, uh, you know, just way too much money. So you've got way too much money chasing way too uh, few goods and services. You have a recipe for terrible inflation. This is not transitory. It's not temporary. This is not about Ukraine. This is not about uh, ultra MAGA or whatever excuse, you know, that Biden is, you know, touting this week. It's real simple. It's basic economics. Too much money is just being shoveled into the economy, especially over the past year, and it is it, it is chasing too few goods and services. And a lot of that also is because of the uh, the regulations on oil and gas, and just Biden's uh, policies, which are anti growth. We just uh, you know had our uh, first quarter uh, growth uh, was what negative one point four percent. Yikes! So you have tons and tons of money just being sloshed into the economy and you don't have an economy as productive as it should be. Worker production declined the most since 1947, according to the latest report. 
So you've got just our, our, our economy is just in shambles. And, you know, I think that this present bout of inflation is about to get much worse. Producer price index report just came out today. Eleven percent. Yikes. What is that index indic- uh, measure? It's it's wholesale. It's, uh, you know, the producer prices, which obviously are going to be passed on to the consumer, because if you're a company, you're not just going to eat the fact that your uh, commodities or your uh, energy inputs are through the roof. You know, just real quick, real quick anecdote. Uh, I've I've been going to the same uh, golf course and hitting, you know, range balls for many, many years. I noticed this year the price of a small range bucket almost doubled. I asked them, what, like, why, why is that? And they said, well, it's mostly because they have to uh, buy so much gasoline for the lawnmowers and for the, you know, golf carts and for all the equipment to maintain the golf course. The price of gasoline, price of diesel is through the roof. They said, we just have to pass it on some way. So what's the easiest way? Hike the price of a range bucket. And that's, yeah. that, that's happening across the board. Yeah. There's a, uh, I'm going to share here a story on that. This isn't in the show notes, but you can see most of the, uh, most of the items that we have, or that it's the articles that we discuss are in the show notes, but this is a, this is an article from, uh, actually an editorial from this morning in the wall street journal about, uh, it's titled inflation stays in the heights, the policy mix of blowout government spending and easy money is punishing workers. Uh, and so, yeah, they lead off. The transitory inflation crowd took another beating on Wednesday as April's expected decline in the rate of in the rate of increase in the consumer price index turned out to be disappointing. This means we've reached peak inflation. We're merely fallen from Mount Everest to K2. Uh, so like, like I mentioned before, the pace of inflation slowed three tenths of a percent for the month. Um, but that was due, as, as I mentioned before, to a 6.1% decline in gasoline prices. But again, that's already been flipped and gas prices are higher now uh, than they were in the beginning of March. In fact, I think it was yesterday, Linnea, that the, the price, the average price for a gallon of gas reached yet another all-time high of uh, $4.49 or something like that nationwide. Uh, also notable, again, the, the core I always thought I thought Jen Saki said corn inflation. It's like, what's corn inflation? Oh, core inflation. Got it. The core <laughs> inflation rate, which is it does not include food and energy, rose six tenths of a percent in April, faster than in March and in February. Uh, and has now climbed six point two percent in the last year. Uh, in fact, um, food prices are up nine point four percent over last year. Again, people see this. People can feel this. Airfares are up. 18.6% in April. And this is another, this is something that actually the Heart Institute feels because we send people to a lot of places. We need to travel around the country to testify in front of state legislatures, go to, you know, different meetings and gatherings of conservatives around the country. And we have to, we're going to have to cut back on that because we didn't budget for a 20% increase in airline flights, you know. <laughs> uh, let's see what else. Oh, and there's another one. Lodging away from home, including hotels and motels, rose 2% in the month and is up 22.6% in one year. So, yes, if you're, uh, as the Wall Street Journal here says, that family vacation is going to be a lot more expensive this summer. Bring a tent. I mean, this <laughs> this is a disaster uh, for, I guess, the administration and for Democrats. But they don't seem all that worried about it. Again, we played that video and it was long, but I thought it was important to to show first their absolute disregard for inflation. It's transitory. Don't worry about it. And then again, Biden was in Illinois this week. He was blaming inflation on, on Trump. He said he inherited a depression, not even a recession when he came <laughs> into office uh, and that he's creating all these jobs and he's cutting the deficit and all of these things. I mean, who wants to take this one? I mean, inflation is crushing the American dream for millions of people. And this administration doesn't seem to care. One of the, one of the things to know too about the CPI is that it might look less drastic than it really is, you know, especially with uh, the 8.3 coming down from 8.1 because it's going off of a base year, you know, 12 months prior. So when, it, when prices started to skyrocket in the second half of last year, that's going to be compared to a more like leveling off effects this year. And so we might see like the CPI rate stay the same, but it's really getting worse. You know, so, so these measures are flawed in a certain way. Hey, you know, Jim, uh, you lived through stagflation. I didn't. I was born <laughs> just after stagflation. But I but I uh, have been writing a lot about stagflation because a lot of economists are uh, sounding the alarm bells that we could be entering a uh 
a new era of stagflation because we've we've got you know persistent inflation it's it's doesn't seem to be abating anytime soon but on top of that you know i mentioned that we had a gdp uh growth of negative 1.4 percent last quarter if we have another quarter of negative gdp growth we will be into a recession if the economy just remains in its stagnant form with uh you know just too many people out of work we got 11 million open jobs just the, the economy is just not functioning properly. It's not firing on all cylinders. When you add that uh, to the inflation uh, you know, issue that we've got right now, we are going to be in for a very, very dark economic uh, period here in the, in the future. Yeah, well, dark economic uh, conditions is what defined the 70s and early late 70s, early 80s. So uh, get ready for it. If you're not uh, if you're younger than the age of 50, you have no memory of it. So you can make your own memories. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Let's uh, I want to share a screen here uh, with our viewers. And this is uh, the latest results from uh, Heartland's latest poll that we did with Rasmussen. We released this uh, a few days ago and it says that a vast majority of voters are worried about rising energy prices, favor increasing drilling in the United States. Um, and again, I think people would want uh, to drill for more oil and to have lower energy prices, because that is one of the main drivers of inflation is the fact that it's going to cost more to, you know, again, going back to that, uh, the statement that Governor Sununu made in New Hampshire about all of this infrastructure spending hasn't been spent yet. So you're going to have all these trucks out there. You're going to have all of this asphalt that needs to be um, made to pave all these roads, right? You have to have all this heavy equipment being delivered by diesel trucks and the diesel prices are going through the roof as well. Diesel prices are actually higher than regular gasoline prices. And this is going to make, well, that infrastructure bill, if you were in support of it, it's going to go a lot less far than it was supposed to, thanks to all of this inflation. And so we have this, this poll again. 82% of likely voters say they're either very or somewhat concerned about rising energy and gas prices under the Biden administration. 60% of likely voters favor a law that would dramatically increase energy, American energy production. And only 30% believe it's very likely climate change will be catastrophic for humans, plants, and animals within the next year. So despite the constant messaging by this administration and our media and you know many billionaires around the country, around the world, like, like uh uh, like Bill Gates, who, if he's not when he's not obsessed with COVID, is obsessed with saving the planet by making us all poor. Uh, Linnea, this is this is not. I, I think we weren't surprised by these by these poll results that the American people want us to get back again. It wasn't that long ago. Talk about ultra mega, ultra mega. We were energy independent and uh, prices were low and employment was high and things seemed to be going great. Well, that's that's totally right. And, you know, one of our questions was, you know, are you in favor of a law that would that could be passed to increase drilling? Well, the truth is, there's really no law that could be passed to increase drilling um, or production, because what we're the situation that we're in is an over regulatory. There are currently too many barriers in place. So you've got on the one hand, the Biden administration is pointing at oil companies and accusing them of um, gouging, price gouging, or at, uh, gasoline companies price gouging because, oh, well, you know, why are gas prices so high? Just a couple of months ago, they were saying that it's the company's fault for not producing more oil. While they say this, they're putting more things into place in, regula in the regulatory sphere um, that would prevent these companies from being able to economically um, you know, drill more wells and produce more pipelines or uh, LNG terminals that would actually bring more oil to market. So they talk out of one side of their mouth while, you know, using these backhanded tactics in the regulatory sphere um, on the other side. Uh, and what it ends up doing is even though it's, you know, what is it today? A hundred and seven dollars a barrel. Um, for Brent crude, even though oil prices are so high, the companies can't economically make any uh, new gains on it and make um, commitments to drilling new wells because there's so much uncertainty. So in a normal time or under someone like President Trump, where the companies know that he is a friendly uh, administration to the oil and gas industry, uh, because of that, the companies would be investing left and right at $105 a barrel. But yeah, because, sorry. No, I'm sorry. 
Um, but because the Biden administration is so hostile towards them and is continuously um, pushing their regulatory agencies to put up more barricades, it's confusing to all of these companies. No one knows what to do. So they're all just kind of sitting back and waiting to see what happens. You're muted. Thank you. I just put up here on the screen. Oh, Donnie's going to kill me for this. All right. <laughs> for all these <laughs> muteds. Uh, put up here on the screen, Biden administration, this is from CBS News, Biden administration, This just this morning, cancels Alaska oil and gas lease sale. Uh, yeah. Renee, I know you've talked about this in the past, but here I'll just read a little bit of the story. The Biden administration has canceled one of the most high profile oil and gas lease opportunities pending before the Interior Department. The decision, which halts the potential to drill in over 1 million acres in the Cook Inlet in in the Cook Inlet in Alaska comes at a challenging political moment when gas prices are hitting painful new highs. Now, Linnea, the, speaking of Jen Psaki, she has been asked about this sort of thing uh, several times over the last year. Uh, and her excuse is always, you know, well, hey, we uh, there's 9,000 leases out there for them to exploit. Uh, right. They should just get to it. And it's big oil's fault for uh, the high gas prices are actually big oil's fault and not anything to do with what this administration's policies are. And as you have pointed out, uh, of those 9,000 leases, there are some that are actually pretty promising to finding oil, and there are some that are garbage. This one in Alaska was definitely one of the promising ones, and it's pretty hard to, to become energy independent when you're not allowed to get your own oil out of your own land. Well, it's constantly frustrating. I can't imagine being um, an executive who makes these sorts of decisions in an oil company right now or a major producer um, where they're trying to juggle getting financing for projects because they do want to move ahead when, you know, we are, we have this high of oil prices. They do want to start producing more oil. Um, but one, it's difficult to get financing in part because the ESG stuff that's becoming fashionable in the investment spheres. Um, two, the regulatory uncertainty is making a lot of these financiers and these investors very nervous about investing in any kind of a petroleum type um, project like pipelines or LNG terminals. Um, you know, we've got all these regulatory agencies like the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that has attempted to pass new greenhouse gas standards, okay. for example, uh, that are way more stringent and are kind of arbitrary. Uh, compared to some of the previous ones that existed. And because of that, all of a sudden, all the all the people who would normally invest in new LNG terminals, which we desperately need because our president is promising Europe that we're going to send them more LNG than ever before in the coming year. Um, Europe typically only takes up a small percentage of our exports compared to Asia. But this year, we've already sent 70% of our exports to Europe. Um, it's it's substantial difference. So we need to make up for it somewhere or the prices are going to get worse and worse and worse. Um, but in the meantime, the regulatory agencies are passing new greenhouse gas restrictions that are tighter than ever before, making it impossible to start new projects, making it harder to get financing to start new projects. It's um, It's really, you know, all these companies are stuck between a rock and a hard place with this. Yeah. And, and let's be clear that the, the, the administration, the Biden administration's justification for rejecting that lease was on environmental grounds, that we have to fight climate change. So we can't allow that lease to be to be exploited. So the misery will continue. Uh, the beatings, <laughs> the beatings will continue until the morale improves, seems to be the uh, the motto of this administration. With the time we have left here, we have about uh, seven minutes or so left in this podcast. I want to hit to our third topic, which is ESG. Uh, Jack McFerrin here on this podcast. He's a research fellow for the Socialism Center, uh, Socialism Research Center, I should say, here at the Heartland Institute. And he has uh, written a piece uh, that I'll put up on the screen here very shortly uh, from our web new website called the1818.com. And it's about ESG ratings. ESG ratings are counterproductive, hypocritical, and anti-American. Now, Jack, I know that uh, a lot of people listening to this podcast have heard about ESG know a little bit about ESG, but I think we can never learn enough because it's so new and it seems to be a pretty slippery target. Why don't you give us a quick rundown? Sure. I mean, I could talk about it for three hours, but I'll try to give the, the one minute elevator uh, pitch about why it's terrible. Um, it's basically, uh, it's like a social credit uh, framework for financial institutions to um, be scored 
and, and um, evaluated based on um, environmental, social, and governance metrics. So instead of being evaluated based on traditional financial risk components, they're being evaluated based on whether, you know, they uh, hit climate emissions targets or, or whether their board is made up of the right sort of um, diverse mix of, uh, of uh, ethnicities. And so they're being evaluated um, based on arbitrary and subjective terms. And that means that, you know, people that are investing, uh, that are trying to be socially conscious, have no idea, you know, where the, where the money's going to go. Um, and when we're seeing that, you know, more and more. Yeah. Well, so, so as you mentioned, we're seeing this more and more. This is, I, sometimes I wonder, Jack, if this is something that is gaining momentum. Uh, we'll, we'll probably talk about this next week. We actually, among the polls we did with Rasmussen was one on, on ESG. Um, what we found was that a lot of people don't know really what it is. Um, you know, Republicans seem to know a little bit more about uh, ESG and it's and, and what is going to be a very deleterious effect on economic freedom, not just uh, on the macro corporate level, but on the individual level as well. And that it's a, you know, really a gateway to the kind of social credit system that they have in China. Uh, this is not conspiracy theory. This is not crazy. Uh, you go to some of the biggest Fortune 500 companies, go to their board meetings, look at their board minutes. They talk about ESG and it's already ruling some of the decisions that they make. Uh, so, so Jack, I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of education that needs to happen, happen on this. But uh, there seems to be, again, this is just a little little hint to the poll results that we'll release next week. There seems to be a growing consensus that the more you know about ESG and the fact that it is not, uh, uh, it's, it's an artificial uh, construct that does not take into account actual profits for people, uh, economic efficiency and all of that. And that the more you learn about it, even in a bipartisan way, even Democrats think, I don't know about this stuff. Yeah, it's, it's a system that, you know, once you learn the basics of and, and the complexities of, you're probably not going to think that um, it's good for the country or or for you and your wallet. Um, and frankly, I mean, it's just the precedent being set for like a small group of financial elites to determine, you know, what's best for these businesses is, is bad. It's absurd. Um, and I just, you know, it, it needs to be stopped. Chris? Yeah, I'm going to come first full circle here, Jim. Put a nice bow on this for you. <laughs> so we, we we talked about MAGA at the beginning of this podcast, okay? The, the MAGA agenda, Make America Great Again, is predicated on corporations should actually do things in the best interest of this country, okay? It is also a uh, just total, uh, you know, repulsion against the establishment and big banks and Wall Street and all that stuff. ESG is the epitome of that. It's the epitome of that on steroids. It's globalism. It's, you know, uh, the, the big banks, you know, funneling money to, to their friends and their cronies. It is the complete antithesis of, of the Make America Great uh, agenda. So to me, it makes perfect sense that the left is completely on board with this, although the polling does show that some Democratic voters, probably Bernie supporters, are a little leery of this. Republicans, you know, are are seem to be on, on both sides of this. And that's I, I, I attribute that to the fact that the Republican Party is still somewhat divided between the, uh, the establishment and the, uh, you know, the, the MAGA crew. But once again, this is if this takes hold and I think it is taking hold, you know, MasterCard just announced that all employee bonuses will be tied to ESG uh, scores. And, and their ESG implementation, that this is going to have a very, very, uh, you know, poor effect on uh, the American economy. But it's going to be great for, you know, globalists and the World Economic Forum and the IMF and all the things that we have been, uh, you know, railing against for the past year or so. Yeah. I mean, the definition of, okay, this is going to be conspiracy theory nuts, or, or maybe this will trigger the algorithm, but like the definition of fascism is the, is the nexus of government power and corporate power yeah. brought together to control the people. Uh, that is what is happening with ESG. This is yet another, is yet another way for the left to imp implement its agenda to force compliance 
with their policy preferences on the on the widest scale possible, ESG is the way to do that. It's just this um, it's just this kind of miracle avenue for them. Uh, and the fact that this has been going on through the World Economic Forum and other places, and now just bubbling up in in America's corporate life, you know, people need to open their eyes. They need to see this. They need to see this for what it is. It, the old adage: uh, He who has the gold makes the rules. ESG is the same thing. He who has the control of ESG is funneling, you know, trillions and trillions of dollars to companies and corporations. And, uh, you know, with, that are on board with their social and economic agenda, it, regardless of whether or not it's good for shareholders, which is their fiduciary responsibility, regardless if it's good or not for the American economy, which should be their moral responsibility. That is correct. Oh, and that music you hear that Donnie Kendall loves so much means we have come to the end of today's this week's. In the Tank podcast, I want to thank everybody who watched our live stream on YouTube, Twitter, Rumble, and other uh, places. I guess Facebook would be the other. <laughs> Thanks for being here and, and uh, participating in the comments. We could put them up on screen. Uh, that was uh, that was a lot of fun. You can do so as well every Thursday at noon Central Time at your favorite place to watch live streams. If you are wanting to get in touch with us, you can email us at in the tank podcast at gmail.com. Linnea Lucan, where can the fine people find you? Um, right now, not so many places. Uh, maybe if, if Twitter becomes a better place, then I might make a Twitter there. But right now, uh, Gab and LinkedIn. All right. Chris Talgo, where can the fine people find you? Stoppingsocialism.com and heartland.org. All right. And uh, Jack McFerrin, are you out there on social media or how can people get a hold of you to learn more about our Socialism Research Center? The1818.com. The The companion to stopping socialism. Excellent. Well, thank you all for listening. Uh, We hope to see you next week and we will talk to you again. Bye-bye.